welcome Westlaw Gospel Chapel. Um, it's Thursday night here, uh, Sunday morning, hopefully for you guys or whenever you guys are listening to this. Um, I appreciate your time and I am truly blessed that you'd like to join me in uh, in praising our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, recognizing what he did on the cross for us and just how good of a God he is. Um, let's start today with praying and we're going to get into uh, the scripture and what uh, what the Lord has told me uh, and kind of showed me and uh, put on my heart to speak with and share with you guys and uh, recognize that uh, through him we have uh, we have redemption and we have salvation and uh, it is truly amazing. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask the Holy Spirit to fill this room to give me words to speak and to be with the people at home today listening to this. I know we can't be together because of uh, the regulations and and uh, whatnot that the government put on us for because of this pandemic. But you work through all things. And you, through your power, Lord, you're going to touch lives. And you are going to save people. And you're going to bring them into relationship with you because of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, and I thank you for that. And I praise you for that. I ask you to let us get close to you today. Let us praise you today. And God, thank you. Thank you for being who you are. And Lord, you were good. Amen. Now, guys, I was uh, tasked this uh, this week um, to uh, to talk to you guys about, guys about Pentecost Sunday because we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday this Sunday, um, which is the uh, the day that the Holy Spirit was given and fulfilled the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ to the disciples. Um, so that the Spirit of God would come in and dwell um, the followers of Jesus and uh, and was sparked the first gospel message given to us by Peter that miraculously changed the hearts and lives of 3,000 men. Um, and it was the first time the Holy Spirit showed up and came a part of, of people. Um, he had been around. Um, he had been around. Um, he had he had worked through the prophets. Um, he was definitely a part of Jesus' uh, mission. Um, but he had, this is a new, new purpose and a new calling when the Holy Spirit shows up and becomes a part of us and indwells us. And it's amazing. Um, so for preparing for this week, I, uh, um, I was given the opportunity to go down to, uh, to do a sermon, uh, sermon uh, workshop with Andreas down at Edmonton, Pastor Andreas with Jared. And I originally, you know, was gung ho about speaking about the Holy Spirit and the powerful works He was going to do, and and the powerful works that He'd showed us in the uh, in in the Scripture and how we can take hold of that power. Um, but then through the workshop, Andreas said, "Don't make the Scriptures say what you want them to say. Say what the Scriptures want you to say." Which is difficult for me because I'm used to saying, "Okay, this is what I'm going to talk about," and I go talk about it. Um, but I had to refocus and say, okay, what is Christ telling us to telling me today to talk to you guys about when it comes to the scripture, the first couple chapters of Acts? And I'm going to find out when we go through this that it's truly all about God and about His His stage and uh, and the stages that He set because He's got a plan and a purpose. And and we're also going to talk about the Holy Spirit too, um, but is all so much about the redemption story and. Uh, you know, to start out with, I kind of think of the redemption story in kind of three different stages or four different stages. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, the first one it would be in the Old Testament. Um, and in the Old Testament, God was establishing and foretelling the means of salvation um, through his prophets and the law. And then during Jesus' time when he walked um, on earth, it was the means of that salvation um, through what he did on the cross. Um, and because of that forgiveness that he's purchased for us. Um, and then the day of Pentecost is the beginning of that next step where we've we've learned about what salvation, what we need for salvation, and then we've gotten given salvation, so the acting out of it, and now we need to proclaim it. And Pentecost was the beginning of that stage, um, which was the proclamation of the salvation, which brings mankind back into relationship with God through the forgiveness and redemption of Jesus Christ. And then there's going to be one more stage when Christ comes back, and that's that future stage when Jesus comes back in a triumphant return and establishing that kingdom and uh, and also judgment as well. Um, so right now, talking about Pentecost Sunday, 
we're blessed that uh, God has given us this Holy Spirit. And the scripture that we're going to go through today is basically the first uh, the first part of Acts, um, Acts 1, 48, and then uh, Acts 2, uh, pretty much uh, majority of Acts 2, all the way down uh, Acts 2, 1, basically down to uh, Acts uh, 38. And it is really marvelous of what God is uh, showing us through this through this scripture and uh, pretty wonderful. Um, the first part that I like to like to point out would be God's plan for our redemption and ushering in the kingdom of God and how that fulfillment through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so God set the stage and uh, has given us the Holy Spirit to go and do a mission. And we're given a mission um, to be the witnesses of Christ to the world. Um, so he's, he's made a plan and a purpose for our lives. Um, you know, playing football, um, we used to have a saying, coaches coach and players play. Um, coaches, you know, their job is to make a game plan. Make a game plan and make sure we're in the best position to win the game and achieve the goal, which is winning the game. And as a player, our job is, yeah, give input, but to be ready and to act when the opportunity and the play is called. And if we're in a situation where we're trying to do our own thing and we're trying to push different things, like can you imagine a defensive lineman shooting into a B gap when he's supposed to be in an A? Probably doesn't make much sense. But the thing is, if you're not doing what you need to do, you're letting the rest of your teammates down. And if you do something that isn't meant to get done at a certain time, A, it's going to make the defense vulnerable. It's going to make your teammates suffer. And you might lose the game or lose points because of it. And God has the same way in his game plan and in his strategy for salvation and his timelines. It's we need to wait on Christ. And we see this in Acts 1, 4 to 8. It reads, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they heard, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at that time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be the witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So, God's timing, God's path, you can see it right there. You know, these men, they had just spent three, three and a half years with Christ, watching him, watching his miracles, understanding and listening to him from scripture, learning the scripture, learning the fulfillments of promises of God, seeing them firsthand. They were ready. The resurrection had already happened. We had 40 days where, where God, where Jesus was with them, um, was with them, teaching them, um, teaching them, giving them, uh, giving them insight, saying, okay, giving them insight of what the, the Bible really meant, how he fulfilled the Bible, how he fulfilled the promises, how he fulfilled the laws. Um, these men were ready to usher in the kingdom of God. Um, they were ready to get Israel back into the stage. And they were pushy. They wanted to make it happen. And God, Jesus said, no, you need to wait. You need to wait for when I have given you the Holy Spirit. Yes, you are given a mission, and this is your mission, and you're going to be the ones who are going to be my hands and the feet, and you're going to be the ones telling people about salvation and telling people about the forgiveness of their sins. But you can only do it through the Holy Spirit because through your power it can't be done. So you need to wait for God's timing, which brings us to Pentecost. Now that would have been happened about 10 days before Pentecost Sunday, after the ascension, and now Pentecost Sunday. 50 days after the resurrection, about 10 days or so after ascension, if I've, if I've got that right from my research and what I've learned, um, it brings us to Acts 2, 1, 4. Now, what the, set the stage, 120 uh, disciples of Christ earnestly waiting for this Holy Spirit. They're not sure what the Holy Spirit is yet. Um, they have the understanding of it, but they don't really know what it's going to all be like. Um, and then uh, um, Acts 2, 1 to 4. Um, stage is set only in the way God can do it, but let's read it and then we'll get into it. Acts 2, 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, just like Jesus had, had requested them and told them to. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it was filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
and divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, that's a pretty amazing sight. You know what I mean? Um, but let's set the stage. 120 disciples in one place in Jerusalem. And that wasn't the big thing. The big thing was that at Jerusalem at the time, about 3,000 plus people would have been in Jerusalem. And people who knew the book of the, the, the Old Testament, that knew the first five books of the, of the Bible were there to celebrate Shavuot. And it's a Jewish festival that commemorates the giving of the Torah, which is the five first books of the Bible. Um, they would have all been gathering in Jerusalem to, for the celebration, um, which is called the Feast of the Weeks. And uh, they would have been there and they would have known the scripture. These were, these were religious men, uh, probably the same men that would have put Jesus on the cross, um, that would have been screaming for his death. They knew, they knew the scripture. They knew who they was. Now, they were all there. And then the Holy Spirit showed up. Now, that's amazing. Now, if 10 days before, they wouldn't have been there. When the disciples said, well, hey, is this when you're going to do it? Can we go? Can we go? Can we go? No, wait upon the Lord and I will set the stage. I will set the stage for 3,000 people to be there, to hear you completely talk in a different language, to hear Peter's first gospel message. But it only happens because they waited. If they would have gone and done it on their own, they wouldn't have had those 3,000 people there, which goes back in our own lives. How is that going to be reflected in our own lives? Listening to God in our own lives is a big deal. Listening to that inner voice of what the Holy Spirit, because he's coming to live inside of us. What does that look like? Um, so not to keep bringing up football, but when I was in high school, I had one of these experiences um, where I can say that was Christ. That was the Holy Spirit talking, not to me, but to my father. Um, my, my, it was my grade 10 year. I had gone to a camp in Toronto and it was a pretty prestigious camp. Um, a bunch of American coaches were there and, oh, I had a terrible, terrible time. It was my first time cramping and I used to get really bad cramps. My whole body would go, my hands, my feet, my jaw. It was terrible. Um, it was my first one and I, it was so hot there and I did not have a good time. I ended up having to get my first IV, had to get taken to the hospital. And then going into my grade 11 year the next year, I did not want to go back. Um, and I said, no, uh, let's just stay in Alberta. Life will be good. But the Holy Spirit spoke to my father and said, you know what? Keith needs to go to this camp. And it turned out, we ended up going, of course. And it turned out that is the day, that is the camp that the D-line coach from the University of Central Florida found me or discovered me and offered me a football scholarship on a roundabout way. It's a whole other story. But if we wouldn't have gone to that camp and wouldn't have listened to the Holy Spirit to go to that camp, I never would have gotten that opportunity. I never would have gotten that noticed. And yes, really did some really great things. Got to play football, which was wonderful. But the big thing is, is I also got to know Christ because through my experiences through then, he brought me so close. And even though it was years, the things that he put in my, put in my path brought me to him, which was absolutely amazing. And that brings me to my next point. The Holy Spirit is powerful and he's promised to live in our hearts of all believers. And it's our responsibility to follow his guidance and his voice. Um, so we're going to get into the scripture right away again. So Acts 2, 2 to 4. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like mighty rushing winds and it was filled and it filled the entire house they were sitting and divided tongues as there were fire appeared on them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, this wasn't just a fanatic utterance of people just running around with their heads, the chickens with their heads cut off. But this is true speaking in other languages and dialects, which only could have come to God. It would be me sitting there and speaking French. Now, I know a little bit, but I don't know any, <laughs> to be honest, or Spanish. Took two years of Spanish, but um, I didn't know how to sp spell C until the second one. Um, God did this. Um, God did this. And then in Acts 2, 9 to 11, and at this sound, the, multiple came, the multitude came together, and they were all bewildered, because each one, of, one was hearing them speak in their own language, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not these all speaking Galilean? Now, 
And at the very end, we hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. You know, it shows that the Holy Spirit is powerful. It shows that he has the means to change a man's tongue, which probably is the most difficult thing out of a person to control. You know, you can tie a man up. You can, you, you can uh, take away his money. You can uh, take away his truck so he can't get to town. But bridling a man's tongue is almost impossible. But the Holy Spirit has the power to change it. Now, there's a reason, though. The reason is that last line. We are hearing them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. You know, we see in the scripture the Holy Spirit doing miracles. But there's always a point. There's always a purpose. And that purpose is to extend the kingdom of God, to share the works of Christ. And that's what it's all about. And we see this later on, too. Um, later in, uh, in Acts, we're going to see Stephen. Um, but it's going to fulfill kind of one of the scriptures that I'd like to like, read out of Luke. Luke 12, 11, 11 and 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about what you, what you should defend yourself and what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, the Holy Spirit, so he's, he's changed their tongues. Now he's going to put words in our mouth too because he, if we trust in him, he will give us the words to speak. And we see this happening when Stephen gets stoned. The Holy Spirit gave him words to speak. He became the first martyr. And people would have flocked to that. Not because of what happened to him. Well, because of what happened to him. But because he was able to speak and talk about and proclaim God through that situation. And became what Jesus did on the cross. That salvation message. You know, that's amazing. And there's other accounts of the Holy Spirit being powerful. Um, in Acts 5 and uh, 15 and 16 so that they carried out the sick into the streets and they laid them on the on, on the cots and the mats that as peter came by at least his shadow might fall on some of them and people also gathered from towns around jerusalem bringing their sick and their afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all healed now it's common god is there to advance the gospel and if the, if the spirit will work and he will do these mighty things if it's in god's purpose now we're going to see here too later on um, about simon the magician you know in uh, he asked the disciples in uh, verse 19 in, in acts give me this power also that anyone i i on whom i lay my hands may receive the holy spirit now, he had just asked the disciples because he found out that the Holy Spirit was given by laying on hands. Now, he said, okay, hey, give me this thing. I'll pay you for it. Now, the, Holy, the, the disciples, they rebuked him. They opposed him and they rebuked him for per, trying to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. Because this is not about what we want. It's not about benefiting in our own personal and sinful desires. But it's about advancing the kingdom of God. And it comes down to this in Psalms 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, it, it really pings about the Holy Spirit in total with the workings of the Holy Spirit. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, if we align ourselves with what he wants, and we do that by reading in the Bible, by, by figuring out, okay, this is how we should be acting. This is the desires of our hearts. We get these desires if we're aligned. And if we're aligned with God, God is easily going to give us our desires because they're going to be aligned with his plan and his purpose, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that's the same thing with all these workings of the Holy Spirit. God, on Pentecost Sunday, was setting up for the biggest stage of a gospel message that we'd ever seen. And probably ever will, because it was the start of something. And so the Holy Spirit was given give these men these utterance to talk about the mighty works of God. Um, they were delighted. They were waiting. They were preparing for the Holy Spirit to show up, for God to show up. They were delighting themselves in the Lord. Um, and then, hey, they got the desire of their house because they started to usher in the kingdom, because they started to share the kingdom. And that's where it really brings us to our last, our last point here. Um, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the cross. Um, and we're called to repentance. You know, I love a good sermon. I love a good sermon that cuts to the heart and delivers that wham-bam fact um, that we're in total dependence of Christ. Um, and through him, we gain salvation. Um, and uh, salvation of our souls and eternal life with uh, our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. 
Um, but I'm also under the understanding that the only way to get that true understanding of the gospel is that for the Holy Spirit has to reveal it to us um, by opening up the eyes of our hearts so that you can see Christ for the true Savior that he is um, and our Redeemer. Um, you know, I was raised in a Christian home. And I grew up in the gospel, um, Sunday school, Bible study, um, Bible camps, youth groups, you know, everything. Dad did evangelism work, um, grew up and gave my life as, to, uh, to, to Christ as a, at a young age. But I tr truly never understood the sinful nature um, of my heart and who I was outside of Christ until later on in life when I listened to one of these hard-hitting messages about who Christ is and what kind of sin, na sinful nature I truly had. Um, and I believe it is because the Holy Spirit opened up my eyes when I was listening to a sermon. It was actually on a sermon on, on, uh, on, uh, on a podcast, uh, watching it on a computer with a buddy of mine when I was uh, playing football. We both were going through this Bible study together. And and Paul Washer came on, and it was just bam, 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 and it was the Holy Spirit. And I can't even halfway remember some of the stuff I remember of what he said, but what I know is the Holy Spirit revealed to me my sinful nature and revealed to me my actual need, not just Jesus is a great guy, but my need for a Savior. And Pentecost Sunday was exactly that. It was the Holy Spirit opening up these men's eyes because Peter delivers just a wham, bam, Holy Spirit filled gospel message. Um, and, he, and he does it. Uh, we see in Acts 2, 22 to 24. You know, this is this is this is the message that he gives. Um, Peter speaks directly to the people of Jerusalem. The same men that were at, in the crowd chanting for Jesus' death about 50 days before. Men of Israel, hear these words: Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As, as you yourself know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan of foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the plans of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Now, he goes directly at confronting them. Directly at confronting their sin. And and how did he die? Through lawless men. Jesus was crucified and killed. These are the same men that were standing there. He went directly to their sin and confronted them for doing wrong. Um, and no acknowledge, and can be no acknowledgement of their need for forgiveness of debt of that wrongdoing. So they went straight to it and said, you know what? You guys are the lawless men. You are the guys that killed Jesus. Now, they would have been in full knowledge of knowing, uh, knowledge that they needed a Messiah, as they would have been devout Jews. Um, the, however, the idea that Jesus um, was this Messiah would have been a little bit far-fetched, because only 53 days ago he was crucified. So Peter had to go to the scripture and defend who Christ, he, he was saying Christ was. So the first thing he does, he attacks, well, he doesn't attack, but he acknowledges their sin. And he says, look at this sin. Look at what you look at what who you are in your sinful nature. You need a savior. You need forgiveness. And these men would have known it because they would have known that there was a coming Messiah. But then he brings to Jesus and he goes to Jesus and he goes to the scriptures to Jesus. So Peter goes in and the first thing he brings up is something that David said in the Psalms. In 16 in Psalm 16, 8 to 11. I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my hand was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let the Holy One see corruption. You may know, had known to me the path of life, and you will make me full of gladness in your presence. Now, to me reading this, this passion be a little bit lost, um, not seeing the correlation to Jesus, However, due to Peter speaking through the Holy Spirit, he was able to open the eyes of these listeners um, and reveal this passage is all about Jesus because he comes back and he goes in Acts 2, 31 to 33. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. 
being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has now poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You know, through the only Spirit, he explained that Jesus is the one that David is pointing to, and along with all the rest of the prophets. The true Messiah that offers salvation to anyone who believes. So he brings that in, and then in Acts 2, 37, 39, 38, Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Told them about their sin. He told them who Jesus really was. Now believe. That's what he did. And that's what Pentecostal, Pentecost Sunday is truly all about. It's all about Christ. It's all about what God, God's salvation story. The stages of getting there, Pentecost Sunday was ushering in the proclamation that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus has come and done his work on the cross and is offering redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Talk about, he talks about their, their need. They talks about your, their, their need for a Savior. They talk about who their Savior is, who is in Jesus Christ, defends it with the Bible, and then says, repent and believe. Now the Holy Spirit opens that has to open up your eyes there. Because you still have to believe that these men have seen the resurrected Christ. You have to believe that Christ is risen. Now, they had witnesses. They were all witness and they all attested that Christ had risen. They had spent 40 days with him. But you still have to believe in the same way. And that's what the Holy Spirit is for. To usher in the kingdom of God. Not for our own desires and our own needs, but to tell people and to open up people's eyes and hearts to the Savior and to our need for his forgiveness. So as a Christian today, I say align yourself with Christ. Be purposeful. Give time. Find time in the Bible. Purposely try to be more like him in your life and remember daily our need for him. And if you're an unbeliever watching, make a commitment. Find out of who Christ is. Look at your life and say, I need a Savior. And pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray to God through the Holy Spirit for forgiveness of your sins. And believe that He is who we said He was. That He was the Son of God. And through His death, He has paid the price for our sins. And through that, we can have redemption and eternal life with Him. So I implore with you, and I ask you, <laughs> Please get in contact with the elders if you want to talk about something, talk about that, and and just get to know him. So guys, I pr thank you guys for being with us today. Um, I appreciate it. Let's end with a quick prayer, and uh, God bless you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being Christ. And as we remember what you've done for us, Lord, and remember the Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit has come and dwelled in inside of us, and that Holy Spirit who opens up our hearts and our minds to, uh, to accept and to understand the mysteries of the gospel and to understand the need for our Savior and to understand that Christ and give us the belief that Christ has done it all. I thank you, God. I praise you. Thank you for being with us, Lord. Amen. Thanks, guys.